everyone this is darker days radio episode number 66 i'm of course one of your hosts mike and tonight i'm joined by chris how's it going chris hello uh very good very very good lots of cool stuff going on right now uh there'll be some of that on the outro um but we'll talk about a little bit in, the, in a bit and of course we are joined by uh our sometime co-host uh james from the isle of wight Hello, hello. It's nice to be back. Well, you so, know, James, it's great to have you back. Oh, thank you. That's that's. It's it's very sweet of you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, yeah. So let's do our normal intro gaming banter. Um, James, what have you been doing gaming wise? Oh, um, so I've actually been uh, I've been writing up my D&D campaign as an adventure book uh, so that I can uh, use it as a portfolio piece and maybe actually sell it for some of those cash monies, um, which, you know, seem to be the the in thing nowadays. Um, But also, gaming-wise, oh, goodness, what have I been playing? Um, Vermintide. I've been playing a lot of Vermintide, um, and I feel very bad for betraying my, my Skaven, so... Nice. Well, yeah, Skaven deserved to be killed. Um, oh. <laughs> I just rap. No, I to be honest, I to be honest, can, I don't think I, I think we're going to have to stop there, Chris. I don't know if we can be friends anymore. No, no, actually, no. <laughs> my, my 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 favorite gang for for Mordheim is Skaven. They're just great. Um, cool. Uh, Obviously, yeah, Kingdom Death, putting together toy soldiers, ready to play the first session tomorrow. Other stuff I've done, um, play some War Machine Hordes with Alex, who I met via the Midnight Express forums. Uh, oh. He is a very cool guy. He has a little signal army. Uh, yeah, so we've got another game scheduled for this Tuesday at the local store. Uh, and um, and of course, James, you stayed out since the last podcast. You you uh, came and visit visited, and we played a one shot of Iron Kingdoms. Indeed, and we also played some uh, um, hybrid. Yep, well. we played some hybrid as well. King uh, Iron Kingdoms was quite interesting because I almost killed both yours and Sam's <laughs> character using yeah. the, uh, the using the really cool wicked NPC from uh, from one of the no quarters, which is Aragon, a uh, uh, a ghost that's attached to a uh, uh, a pistol. So it's kind of like not quite a pistol wraith, but a little bit. So he possesses the person that picks up the pistol. So I think he's going to be uh, reoccurring at some point in Iron Kingdoms because he's just kind of too cool. He's just too cool. Um, that was a really fun game because we used some of the Terraclip scenery. So you had you guys stalking through uh, some sewers to uh, find what uh, to track down this menacing killer. Uh, so that was and a lot leaping. Of fun. Leaping at people up on gangways and things. That was, that was yeah. good fun. Uh, Mike, gaming-wise? Well, you know, it's been quite a while since we uh, recorded our last episode, and a lot of things changed. Uh, stop playing Exalted, stop running Exalted, and uh, never going to touch that game again. <laughs> but, but I went back to a, uh, a much more more stable and intuitive game system known as Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. And we've been uh, running through the old uh, Ravenloft module uh, for D&D, which has been uh, quite the delight. You've run Ravenloft before for third, well, for D20. Did you yeah, yeah, it? I yeah. ran the uh, the third edition back uh, when I was an undergrad. So, how's that comparing? Would you say does is or how does the adventure module for you know AD and D compare? Does it? Does it have a different feel, a different tone, or is it is it better horror? Uh, well, the thing with the original module is that it's kind of still just a dungeon crawl, but with a lot of kind of uh, gothic uh, atmosphere and aesthetic put in, uh, particularly with you going through this uh, 
very dark stone gargoyle laden castle. Uh, and then mechanically, uh, the difference is that AD and D Second Edition is significantly more deadly than Third Edition, Fourth right. Edition, and the newer Fifth Edition of uh, of D and D. But yeah, it's really interesting, and uh, it's really cool going back and playing the old uh, AD and D Second Edition because it's a uh, it's not that bad of a game system actually. Uh, it's it's strange the way it was designed wasn't uh, the same. Uh, kind of universal mechanic you tend to see in every modern game uh, these days, like World of Darkness, you have your dice pools, uh, Shadowrun dice pools as well. Uh, D20 system, you have your your 20-sided die dice roll. With AD&D 2nd Edition, it's kind of all these different little mini-games, hacks, and fixes, which were all kind of combined. So saving throws, you're trying to roll above something, ability, ability rolls, you're trying to roll below your statistic, uh, D20s for attacks, Thief things, you're using D percentiles. Searching for rooms, you're using D6s. It's a little bizarre uh, to keep track of everything, but once you do, it's actually a fairly balanced system when you get down to it, uh, especially if you ignore a lot of the crazy player options books. Ooh, cool. Um, that sounds really cool. Yeah, it's a good time. It's a good time. Uh, James, which edition of D&D are you playing right now? Uh, I'm playing 5th edition myself at the moment. Um, nice. I've had a chance to play in it, and I'm also running my campaign. Um, and it's it's been really interesting. We've had a couple of complete newbies take to it, and they've picked it up really quickly, which has been good. Uh, and we have maybe two players who've been playing D&D before. Um, one of them is very upset that they don't have Thaco anymore. Uh, <laughs> Which I think means they've been. It's been a long time since they've D and D'd. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, fifth edition is great. And uh, you know, if you talked to me like two, three years ago, I pretty much would have told you that Dungeons and Dragons was was dead to me. But uh, that new edition definitely has a lot of uh, cool, you know, attrition based uh, uh, gameplay to it that I think is really cool and uh, uh, you know really harkens back to uh, older editions of D and D. Um, but has a lot of the modernization that was also uh, implemented with uh, with fourth edition D and D as well, which is uh, good for accessibility with new players. Yeah, people people seem to have kind of found their uh, people seem to find it quite accessible. Um, move you if you're strong and you want to do a thing because you're strong, you roll with your strength, and it just kind of. It seems to flow a little bit better. People are, I've found that people have been willing to say, I want to try this thing. What do I need to do for it? And as a GM, that's where I just go, yeah, sure, give me, give me a roll, and I will sort all of the numbers bits out for you. Mm. Um, it's, been, it's been good. So yeah. given you're both running D&D in some uh, version, and of course I've run some Iron Kingdoms recently, and James, who's taking part in that? How would you, how would you say? Because all these settings were in some way running some sort of fantasy mashup that includes either very explicitly a horror element like Ravenloft, mm. or Iron Kingdoms, which quite happily has a large portion that is horror based because you've got pricks, you've got you've got the undeadness of the cricks, you've got the body horror of, say, uh, the Legion of Everblight, and you've got the weirdness and torture magic of the Scorn, plus you've got the Witchfire trilogy, which is, at its heart, uh, an undead kind of based campaign. Um, getting horror into D&D and dungeon crawlers or things that on the, on the surface look like fantasy games... Um, how does that work for you guys? Like, or how have players responded to that? How you get across that feeling of horror, that tension, that uh, that that level of um, threat of the of the things that go bump in the night? Oh. That's, uh... Well, I can say uh, in, in Ravenloft it's pretty easy because they're stuck in a uh, vampire's castle and the vampire's trying to kill them. So, you know, there's a lot of crazy traps and uh, you can't really trust anything. Uh, for example, uh, there was this one time where basically they went up to the highest tower in the castle. Uh, they were just kind of looking around and I previously rolled up that that was one of the areas where they were going to encounter uh, the vampire Count Strahd. 
He descends, uh, casts a uh, stone wall behind them so they can't exit back down the stairs. He kills the wizard, kills the cleric, and then books it out of there because the sunlight's out. And there they are, just the uh, fighter and the thief left. And what are they going to do? They, uh, they only have... So it's like a 100-foot drop to the uh, next uh, tower uh, to get to. And they only have 40 feet of rope. <laughs> so they have to kind of crawl Jesus down. Really, the, the players create a lot of the, uh, a lot of the tension uh, themselves by, by their own actions. Um, for example, last session... We had one character just beat the uh, the mayor's son, essentially the burgomeister's son, uh, nearly to death in the street uh, because they didn't like what he was saying, and he was uh, kind of siding with the uh, evil count. And so that they, was they... just horrific to all the other players standing around him that he just did this. Uh, and then another player, when no one was looking, just murdered a uh, another uh, <laughs> NPC uh, in Shit. the castle who was the uh, the count's uh, kind of servant. Porter, if you will. It was it was a brutal session, actually, last time. Uh, so a lot of it really is just the players doing terrible things, and the rest of them being kind of horrified by it, because they know that uh, there's these these mechanics, the dark powers checks, and if you do a lot of bad things, uh, the evil forces of the land will take notice. Oh, uh, right. Okay. The other characters, you know, when this stuff happens, they kind of get leery that, hey, maybe we're going to get found out. Maybe uh, we're going to have the uh, Eye of Sauron upon us. Nice. So with with that, Mike, um, when you said like obviously the the vampire who killed all the all the killed those two characters, and then you know then had to flee because of the sunlight, are the players then quite aware that they they sometimes are aware of what time of the day that it is, so that they can use it to their favor and try and like you know you know try and like Play, play it to their favor so they go, oh, if we just survive for a bit longer, it's daylight, and we can then go for that, uh, go into that chamber or that location and, you know, root out the uh, the vampire. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's a window nearby, they can, they can look out, and uh, if it's not too overcast, they can figure out what time of day it is. But unfortunately, timepieces are rather expensive in uh, old Dungeons & Dragons, so <laughs> okay. yeah, it's a little tough for them to, uh, to keep track of that. But yeah, it's interesting uh, how much is really just, just player-driven and things that they kind of create in their own mind as well. Um, how have know, you... It's been uh, pretty good. How have you... Because you said that you had two characters like just dead like that. How did you work in new player characters into the setting in a in a uh, in a in a way that fitted with the story because obviously the 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 setting itself that you're running is quite confined like it's very hmm. it's limited as in they can't just wander off to an entirely different town or or city or something like that so uh, and obviously if they're trapped in a castle again there's a limit to the people they encounter so how have you worked that in uh, that was pretty simple because uh, the, the main objective after losing uh, three fifths of the party, because another character had just died uh, recently, was to get the heck out of there. And uh, when they successfully got back to the uh, oh, okay, village, yeah. uh, with a bunch of lucky rules to not run into you know random encounters, we're kind of running this as like hardcore 1989 AD and D. Uh, so I'm following pretty much every rule I can uh, and making it as uh, as harsh as possible, to be honest. Uh, when they got back there, they, uh, you know, ran into some other characters, and uh, of course, the vampire count wants to chase after them, so he sends down a zombie army, and uh, everyone has to fight for their lives, so, boom! New party right there. Okay, I've got a question I'm going to bring back to that, because it, it ties in with something else. Um, uh, related to what I've, my experience of running Iron Kingdom. So, James, what horror elements have you put into your kind of fantasy games that you're running um, into your D and D? Well, it's it's been quite interesting because I I actually ran a I ran a Pathfinder campaign which was specifically set up as a uh, I, I ran it from a book which was specifically set up as a horror campaign and it called up all these various kind of horror movie tropes and things. So you had uh, the first one was um, a haunted prison, and then the second one's Frankenstein's monster, and you go to the castle and fight him up there. Um, but I found players weren't really scared of any of these things. Mm. Um, so from my experience with Pathfinder, where people people weren't scared of anything they could fight, um, 
because you know they're adventurers and they fight these things. If there's a fight, they should be able to do it because that's how things are balanced. So my current campaign, I think the first fight that they had, um, they descended into a uh, they descended into an old abandoned barrow. Um, and deep beneath the barrow, inside this spiral staircase, there's a uh, like a room that's pitch black. And unfortunately, half the like more than half the party has perfect night vision because they're uh, <laughs> thanks to their racial racial choices, which was interesting. Um, but they they got attacked by some stuff that should really have brutally murdered a lot of them, uh, and they took they took a lot of damage. And they re- I think one of the things you've got to do is start with. <laughs> They're not. It's not going to be super safe. That there is danger, and I think that's that sounds a little bit like the um, the Ravenloft um, monsters that can actually harm players more than just oh you're going to take these hit point damage. You're going to take this hit point damage, and then you're going to repair it. I mean the the whole horror campaign. The one thing that actually scared the characters was when they encountered a rust monster because they might lose their fifty thousand gold pieces weapons. Um, and that kind of made me realize that, yeah, you you want to put something that they are relying on at risk, and that, that kind of creeps them out. Um, mm-hmm. In my current campaign, I actually killed their quest giver. Uh, the, the guy who gave them the very hook at the beginning of the game, they brought the magical artifact back to him, and he got assassinated in front of them. And the assassins got away with it and disappeared off into into the mists. Um, and I think knowing that you know they they can't just oh this NPC will be here for ages. You know we've got a friend he's going to bankroll us and do all this stuff. They realised they actually had no way of getting any money. All <laughs> of the work they'd done was for nothing unless they could figure out what they needed to do. And they actually um, they did find that kind of creepy. Uh, that's yeah. That's interesting. The the interesting part is it's interesting when, from what I've done for vampires, when you you and other games, this when you turn on 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 its head, the interaction between the players and the quest giver, the the, mm-hmm. the person that hires them, their mentor, because especially in vampire, if you don't begin to act with a certain amount of autonomy. That per- you, that person that's giving you a job is eventually going to re- realize that you're becoming comparable to them in 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 both resources and power and so forth to threaten them. So at some point they are going to sell you out, especially in vampire. They're going to sell you out, or they're going to die, and everyone that was looking to them for things are going to start looking to you, and either you prove that you can fill that hole, or you're going to get killed. Um, so, you know, ensuring kind of like getting players to to act in an autonomous way is is very important. I guess that's driven by fear, and you've got to drive that. You've got to give them things to fear. Something I was going to ask is actually, I mean, especially for the Raven Lost Loft thing. Uh, Mike, obviously you have a lot of undead in your game. Do do the players really fear? Uh, do the players really fear the the skeletons? He's not there. He's lost audio, I think. Oh no, he's lost audio. Um, uh, James, how do you do deal with that? Maybe have you dealt with? Um. So I, I, ne- well, yeah, I've de- I dealt specifically with some undead uh, undead creatures in my recent campaign, and I found that making uh, a lot of it is setting things up. And players, uh, Mike said that players often read into a situation. I found that I described a room as quite as quiet that the players couldn't really hear anything, and they went, "Is it?" Is it suspiciously quiet? Is it too quiet? And I was like, yes, yes, of course it is. It is definitely too quiet. And then they got themselves all up in a uh, a worry about it. Um, mm. With undead, I've been uh, in a similar way. You, um, I make sure I actually focus on descriptions and things, and I try and throw in throw in some tests, 
like roles that aren't actually necessarily called for in the rules. So one of the characters, the first time they encountered an undead was this zombie on the uh, a zombie woodcutter on the path to this ancient barrow. Um, he'd he'd been ripped apart by a f- pack of uh, skeletal hounds. So he dragged himself a, uh, dragged himself along the path towards them, guts splaying out. And you make sure you do a description of that, but someone went to attack him. And I was like, yes, can you actually overcome your fear? I'm going to make you do a check to see whether you actually, you know, this is a dead body. This is horrific. Yeah. Your character's got religious values that, you know, the, the body is sacred after death. So this is kind of creepy for you. And if by bringing it into the rules, it kind of made them think it from a character's perspective. Uh, admittedly, I fly I think that's the point we're getting at is, is that it's quite easy for players to treat the undead or horrific things like that, especially in dungeon crawls, maybe, as just another thing to kill. And they yes. don't really think about how it is quite a gruesome thing to see the, the human body uh, you know, perverted in that manner and desecrated mm. uh, and used for the whims of some unseen force. And, you know, the fear that you would have facing the undead. Uh, and it's a hard one because obviously, you know, again, I think that's the same with anything, like whether it's orcs or or anything, it's trying to impress kind of like what that type of encounter, how kind of, what kind of horror it is. Um, what did you, because obviously James, he played in, in this. Um, what did you make of the, we had two main kind of like, the, there was a horror element that was like a, there was a hot element to the story of the five Vikings, which was the, the uh, mm-hmm. which was this, you know, serial killer going on, and you had to, you know, talk to the the homeless people in Corvus because that was where some, most of the deaths had occurred, uh, and then dealing with the bodies and investigating those, and then eventually coming face to face with just what was really a random encounter that I wrote out for which was like, you know, the Swamp Shambler zombies coming out of the uh, sewers, and then eventually, you know, tracking down uh, the killer uh, for the next encounter. Um, What did you make of the Swamp Shamblers? Was there anything that you found particular to Iron Kingdoms that made them feel kind of different to the regular undead zombie, or, or was it just because they were just clawing their way out of the sewers? in a city that is notorious for being played by the undead. I think it managed to be quite creepy because we were two people in that, uh, in the one shot, which meant that we didn't have the, we didn't have the backing of a large group. Mm. Um, so when we did find a whole group of zombies, that actually, like, it was a matter of numbers. We were, we were in danger of being surrounded straight away. And in fact, we did get ganged up on by the zombies. And they have, uh, they've got rules that kind of enforce that effect. Yes, um, they, they, have a, they have a rule that means they can gang up on you. They get a bonus if they gang up on you. Uh, they're quite hard to kill, actually. I mean, I, we kind of glossed over it because we had a time constraint. But they're, like, even if you kill them, if you, if you reduce all the hit points, there's a chance they may not even die. <laughs> they actually still just remain there with a single hit point, which which adds that thing like they're they're quite um, resilient. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I think played into making them feel thematically like they're undead was the fact that your character was able to like fire off holy bolts of energy uh, as part of his magic, and the fact that Sam's character has like a, a holy pistol has a pistol that fires basically holy holy bullets um, I think kind of reinforce how they're undead and they're tough to kill unless you are obviously on the, the side of, of of good in whatever good is or, or blessed by whichever god um, what did you make then of the um, of the possessed uh, gunman with his uh, with his necromantically uh, 
his pistol, which is the necromantic anchor for the gun. Were you kind of were you not expecting him to be like, oh god, we just shot him, and then this with a holy bullet, and then this ephemeral ghost to come out of his body? He managed to creep me out. Uh, he actually creeped me out. The, the zombies ended up being, you know, I was I got worried about the zombies because when I attacked them with my fists, I realised that I wasn't going to be taking them out, and I ended up having to back up and kind of huddle into a corner. Um, the gunman, though, he was. He was doing something strange with the gun, like whispering, whispering names into it, um, and that I think having something strange like that, having an action that is not expected, that that kind of makes you worried about things, especially when someone, especially when someone has a lot of faith in whatever they're doing, hmm. you know. Um, so you, the guy takes time in the middle of a fight to talk to his gun. Well, what the heck is going on here? Like <laughs> yeah. that's like either the guy's a nutcase and he's still going to shoot us, or you know he's he's got something odd going on. Well, it kind of gave what gives the game away there is the fact that his gun glowed green with necromantic runes. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but yeah, the the unexpected, like that's and that's kind of a horror thing, isn't it? You see something where you weren't expecting it. Um, uh, let's see if Mike's back and we can hear him. Yo. So hey. how do you deal with in Ravenloft that with the undead and keeping that fear of the undead for your players? Because, I mean, this is a common thing, really, for any... Even for World of Darkness, it's a common thing. How do you reinforce the terror of things so they don't become mundane? Well, the way that Ravenloft works is there's a lot of mechanical reasons for characters and players to kind of be fearful. Um, you know, there is, like, fear, horror, madness checks, and that sort of thing, which I don't really use ever. Um, but there's a lot of mechanics which will, for example, change uh, target values from what they expect them to be. Like, they have a table which says, like, oh, I should be able to turn a zombie on, like, a roll of six or higher. But then hmm. they roll a 12, and it doesn't work. So a lot of stuff like that really just kind of uh, creeps them out. Um, but in addition to um, you know that game system and, and campaign setting, uh, yeah, I usually try to go pretty uh, heavy on the descriptions, um, drop a few things which will unsettle the players and make them think that something's up, even if there perhaps is not. Um, and... I think yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, descriptions, mechanics, that's really the two aspects of a role-playing game that you kind of use. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you're moving on more to, like, World of Darkness games, uh, you need to, I think, kind of lay off the mechanics a lot of the times. And, uh, you know, an important distinction between the games that we've been talking about and World of Darkness games is that uh, it's less um, material effects that you you know, uh, you can't really like destroy their weapons or their armor or something like that. Uh, you have to focus more on their relationships, interactions, and uh, you know, permanent uh, effects on their psyche or their uh, their personality uh, as being the uh, more horrific aspects to focus on in a World of Darkness game. Yeah, and I think related to that is the fact that World of Darkness allows you. To it, it has a it has the nudge mechanics. I mean, this is like with conditions, especially now, uh, to for players to play into the horror and allow bad things to happen to them. And if anything, it's that possibly is even more creepy is the fact that players can can creep themselves out by going, actually, it's this and this is what happens, and thus I get a condition from it. Because a player's imagination of what is horrific is always going to be is always going to be uh, more profound than what you can can push into the, can describe or or suggest to a player. Um, cool. That's a pretty good introduction on on uh, horror gaming, I think, and, and ideas on stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. Shall we move on with actual World of Darkness news? It 
with regard to World of Darkness news, uh, we're actually going to be trying something a little bit different, a little bit of a different format uh, in the future with Darker Days. Uh, see how it works out. We're going to be focusing on you know, an intro discussing horror gaming and any general news that we have, uh, followed by, of course, the secret frequency, then a, a main segment. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, Mummy's Book of the Deceived, and then finally uh, closing, where we're going to be uh, naming the uh, winners of our most recent contest. So that should be all good. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, like horror gaming and World of Darkness news, um, uh, there's a new Kickstarter out uh, for Werewolf the Apocalypse uh, Shattered Dreams, uh, which is pretty cool. And uh, hopefully we're going to be getting a Changeling 20th uh, soon. I haven't heard too much about that, but uh, 2015's almost over. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't, that's that's going to be interesting. Um, I haven't really followed what else there is World of Darkness news. I know that Exalted, the edition, is very close to getting to backer's hands. Um, I will be interested in getting hold of the PDF to that. Um, but that's not very World of Darkness-y. Uh, <laughs> uh, other White Wolf news... I, I don't know, Mike, you, have you got the webpage up and looking at it? Uh, nope. Nope. Uh, okay, I'm going to go to the Onyx Path publishing website. I'm, I'm not really that worried about it. Uh, not uh, too many new books have come out. There's a few things that work. It's like there's been some updates on like what's got red lines and what hasn't. Uh, the typical, the typical stuff like um, like the open. There's so I think any web in the open uh, development for Vampire Fourth Edition. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vampire the Masquerade. So, so you're talking about the embrace. Um, we've got ready-made characters for Geist coming out, some new ones. Uh, what else is there? Lots and lots. There's lots. There's lots of good stuff coming up. Um, and I think we'll we'll be able to talk about more when, say, uh, Dark Eras comes out for New Order Darkness, uh, and some other books finally make it into our hands. Yeah. Yep, totally. Cool. And uh, with that, should we move on over to the secret frequency? Oh, yes. It's under the stairs. <laughs> okay, so uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, ghost ships. Uh, I'm going to present uh, three legends and then James and... Uh, Chris will kind of add their own perspectives and insight into how to use these in your World of Darkness games. So the first up is a legend from from Germany uh, about a certain Baron Falkenberg. Germany's North Sea is haunted by the legend of uh, the medieval Baron Falkenberg, whose story is said to begin when his long-lost brother returned home rich and planned to marry a village maiden that the Baron himself had his eye on. At the wedding feast, the plentiful food and champagne temporarily soothed the Baron's soul. But not for long. According to one telling, the Baron's brother touched him up in the wrong place. Not sure what that means. And uh, whereupon the the, uh, Baron picked up a champagne bottle and bashed it over his brother's head. The room fell down dead and his bride ran screaming into the room. The Baron tried to convince her of his love but she declared that she would rather die than accept him. And the Baron took that fairly literally and uh, stabbed her in the heart with a knife. The Baron then fled to the beach where he found a boat and a man who stood up and said, The captain has been expecting you. The Baron got into the boat, which took him to a gray ship, and he has not disembarked in 600 years. Those who have seen the Baron's vessel sailing in the North Sea say it's always heading north, without helm or helmsman, and that the masthead flickers with a blue flame, illuminating the sight of uh, the baron on the deck, playing dice with the devil for control of his soul. In uh, the classic World of Darkness, uh, the myth of Baron Falkenberg uh, holds a particular resonance, uh, most overtly in Wraith the Oblivion. Uh, The boat that Baron Falkenberg uh, could actually be a ferryman However, how could a ferryman interact with the uh, Skinlands so readily? Uh, in Wraith, certain holidays, such as Samhain or even Christmas, 
uh, have a weakened shroud, but uh, typically it's not so weakened that uh, wraiths can so readily interact. So what sort of an astrological alignment could allow a wraith or and his artifact, a ship, to actually travel to the skinlands and fool passengers into coming back with them into the shadow? And in Vampire the Masquerade, uh, Baron Falkenberg could actually be a cautionary tale told to uh, fledglings, illustrating the dangers of the beast and the need for a masquerade. Uh, and there might actually be some truth to it. Uh, maybe Baron Falkenberg has spiraled out of control and now sails the seas as a semi-articulate white. And you can actually take uh, Baron Falkenberg's backstory and use it for some pretty cool ideas uh, for Hunt of the Reckoning. You could update it to the modern knights and have uh, Joshua Falkenberg be imbued at his brother's wedding when he realizes that his kin is actually wrong. And now Joshua has fled to international waters where uh, he's made an unlikely ally with a crew upon a small ship. So what do you guys think about that one? Any ideas? Um, okay. Uh, immediately I thought of... Well, okay, you've got the classic Wraith one. Um, maybe this character... Uh, it, and the ship he's on, um, a journey between the material world and the underworld via some unknown gateway, some Avernian gate that leads to a particular, um, a particular, what's the word I'm looking for, domain in the underworld. Uh, I can't remember its name off by heart, but it is in... Uh, Book of the Dead, which is, there's a domain which is like a, a, an ocean that ex that's in a giant cavern, so you, you can't see the night sky. Um, so you could definitely tie that into that use of the domain, so Baron Falkenberg could be a, uh, a, a ghost that exists in that domain. Um, as he said, with the holidays and, and uh, with uh, Sawen uh, and other times when the uh, there's verges and so forth. Um, perhaps the reason why he acted in such a, uh, a murderous way was actually that he uh, had returned on a boat uh, from, uh, say, having escaped Arcadia. So we're going for Changeling here, uh, Changeling the Lost. And so when he uh, flees, you know, he is met by by a particular fae who's ready to take him back into his Avernian gate. But maybe maybe when he gets onto the boat, he then actually does gamble for his release, and he does get away. And now he uh, is at some freehold uh, looking to exact revenge on the fae that had driven him to murder both his brother and uh, his brother's uh, wife-to-be. Um... Oh, I'm trying to think of some other ideas, uh, other games that can tie in. I'm sure you could most prob. There's some other ways you could tie in something with ghosts. Maybe Baron Falkenberg is actually a geist to bind with one of your Sin Eater characters uh, in some yeah. manner. Uh, I think that's the cool thing with geists is you could find you can find historical ghosts like these and have them become a geist. So he's become somehow a uh, a ghost who also embodies the 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 concept of death following unrequited you know unrequited love. Um, yeah, that's my ideas there. Cool. Nice. So, uh, moving on, here's another one, uh, which actually comes from uh, Chile's uh, Chiloa Islands. Uh, these islands are known for their terrible storms and for sightings of the Chilue, uh, sorry, Caluhe, uh, a demon ship with luminescent white sides and blood-red sails. Uh, it's more than just your average ghost ship. Uh, the Caluche... Uh, is uh, a sentient being that can glide across the surface of water at impossible speeds or dive beneath them like a whale. Observers say that uh, when it passes, you can hear the cackling of its demon crew who hop around on one leg and have faces that spin backwards. The ship is also manned by sailors both dead and alive, either dragged from the deep 
or stolen from passing ships. However, the Kaluche only has use for the officers it finds and spills the others ha- uh, driven half insane onto local beaches. In other versions of the tales of the ship, it is piloted by the souls of the drowned. Merchants who trade with the boat become suddenly wealthy, while those who, s- who see it supposedly wear crooked smiles forever. So when we get Mike back on, uh, which hopefully is in a bit. Um, so Mike has suggested that in Werewolf, the Dark Ages, or Werewolf the Wild West, the Caluche is a great example of a worm-tainted ship. The crew are Femori, stealing sailors from other ships to be possessed and, jo- and join their fleet. Uh, the Guru are, s- are stunning warriors uh, on land, and how will they fare on the open sea? So, I will suggest that uh, other ways we could use this... Um, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna go with New World of Darkness because I can think of some other things there. So in Werewolf, the uh, the Forsaken, uh, quite similar to the idea of a worm tainted ship. The ship is actually one of the. Uh, oh God, why can't I think of the name of them? Think, Chris. Think. Uh, it's not the Earthborn. One of the the Moon Banished, the Edigum. So those are like conceptual spirits, or they don't have a form. But this one had returned to Earth by some means and has finally taken a form, which is this demonic kind of ship. And likewise, its crew are spirits that have bound with sailors and twisted them and uh, malformed them. And, you know, for the fact that Werewolf the the Forsaken is very territory-based, you would get a sense that the ship is nearby tainting your territory because suddenly on the coastline, which makes up part of your territory, are these strange malshapen undead which have been thrown up on the beach uh, by by the passing of this ship. Perhaps it is some demon ship. Uh, You could use the ideas from uh, it could be an actual demon ship with an undead crew and use the ideas from uh, from uh, Inferno, which is a book for New Order Darkness. And in that case, then, maybe this ship is a represents greed, because obviously pirates only need more gold. Any other ideas, James? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, might be, I might be reaching a little bit here, but uh, it talks about the ship being a, a living thing. And it made me make it made me think possibly of Promethean or something. I don't oh, know whether okay. like an aberrant or something. Are, are they aberrants? Are oh, the... well, you've got Promethean. Uh, you've got Prometheans and their main antagonists are either uh, other Prometheans, hmm. or you've got uh, Pandorans. Uh, so yeah, that's a it very be, weird one. It could be. It a could really be weird... stealing stealing people because at the the, uh, the aber. They're trying to become more like humans, so maybe it's stealing people to, like, if it gets enough of them. Oh, it... so you're saying it's crewed by by really twisted Prometheans, um, oh. or possibly? Oh, what was the other thing I was going? Um... But no, that works, James, because yeah. the 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 crew, the the crew it discards that are made up of could be the failed experiments to create. New Prometheans, which is a major milestone for Prometheans to become more human. So those those things thrown up are bodies, which then eventually become Pandorans, which go on to cause havoc to the local Prometheans. There, so it's kind of similar to the idea to Werewolf, maybe to the Werewolf idea, but it has a new twist on it. Um, you could maybe hook it into mummy, possibly because uh, lots of mummies are buried with uh, ghosts. I don't know, you're buried with uh, imit like carvings of carts and things and boats. So maybe you've been buried with uh, you've been buried with some ships, and they had little little uh, so- sailors on them or something. And some things, if this is a ghost ship, maybe it's actually managed to steal the souls of the sailors you've been buried with or something, and you've been woken up because there's some crazy goings. I I'm not sure how many mummies are going to be in in Germany, uh, but. Uh well, uh, the, well this one isn't the German myth. This is a Chilean one. So, oh, the Chilean one. Sorry, yes. So the the 
but the, the idea of that the with the boat obviously that fits in with the idea of like you know with how souls are ferried from the world of the living to the world of the dead to the duat uh, in Egyptian myth. So this could be some inversion of that. And it is just, it, this ship has an even more ancient history that goes all the way back to, as you say, the ancient Egyptians. Ooh, what other ideas could we throw out there with classic world of darkness? Oh, if you really want to get weird, here you go. You've got a demonic ship. Mm-hmm. That seems alive. You've got twisted, malshapen sailors thrown up onto the beach. What does that say to you? What does that say to you? I'll tell you what it says to me. It's, it, it says to me, Zamiche. So, oh. flesh-crafting vampires. So, a flesh-crafted ship. That's That's weird. And considering this ship is meant to be able to dive under the waters and almost be like... It could be a flesh-crafted whale made into a ship. Uh, and its ragged its ragged sails are, in fact, made from the lungs of the whale. Uh, okay, that's a weird, really weird picture. That's, that uh, sounds horrendous and fantastic. I love it. I've kind of got... <laughs> I've almost got in my head pictures of the um, the bad guy's ship in... Pirates of Dark Water. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's a that's a that's a cool, cool kind of evil ship. Um, yeah, uh, this one concerns the SS Valencia. It's been called the worst disaster in uh, in the graveyard of Pacific, a treacherous stretch of coastal water from Oregon to Vancouver Island. On January tw- January twenty second, nineteen o six, the Valencia, a coastal passenger liner en route from San Francisco to Seattle via Victoria, snagged on a submerged reef on the southwest west coast of Vancouver Island. Would be rescuers were thwarted by the jagged, uncharted rocks and and the fierce storm that was blowing, and many lifeboats capsized in the rolling waters. For 36 hours, scores of passengers clung to the deck or the rigging, enduring a series of strategic errors by rescuers and crew. Finally, a giant wave swept most of them out to sea. Only 37 of the 136 passengers survived, and all of the ship's women and children perished. That's staggering, actually, reading that from here afresh, because I didn't read that part of the website, so wow. Um... An investigation into the disaster resulted in the creation of the Panchena Point Lighthouse and a life-saving trail uh, for shipwrecked mariners, uh, which later became the West Coast Trail. Uh, Several occurrences uh, have been reported in connection with the disaster. Some on board the nearby ship reported seeing an image of the Valencia take shape in the the exhaust cloud formed by the rescue ship uh, City of Topoque which managed to save some of the survivors. For years afterwards, sailors on the west coast of Vancouver Island reported seeing a phantom, Valencia, a phantom Valencia foundering on the waves, its terrified passengers and crew still holding on for dear life. There were also reports of Indian fishermen discovering a lifeboat either manned by skeletons on the water or filled with skeletons and mysteriously hidden inside a cave. But perhaps most incredible of all is the fact that Valencia lifeboat number no. five was found drifting in Barclay Sound in 1933, still in decent condition 25, 27 years after the, after the disaster. Part of the lifeboat went on display in the Maritime, Maritime Museum in Victoria, uh, in British Columbia. Uh, my immediate idea then for this is is to uh, maybe use it as part of Demon the Descent. It is some offering uh, to, that the god... Well, some offering, when I say... It forms part of an occult matrix for the god machine. So all the events making this this uh, this graveyard in the ocean, this notorious place where ships uh, sink, is all part of an occult matrix. And all the, the mistakes made by the rescuers and crews were all part of this formed plan in order to snare all the souls 
of these women and children for whatever reason the God machine has, maybe to bring into being a particular angel or some other act. But perhaps then was that that is the goat why we see the ghost of the ship and we see these souls and they're all the remains of this occult matrix perhaps there is some kind of fractured part of reality and the, the ship did actually disappear it survived and we now see variations of that reality that either the ship still survives or we see some of the crew are dead or or some such with the fact that all the women and children died, maybe, again, that kind of fits in quite well with Changeling, uh, the Lost. Uh, maybe it fits in with, I'm trying to think, think classic World of Darkness. Maybe it fits in with Mage. Maybe this is some grand offering by a Nefandi to some evil uh, Klepothic power. Uh, and that is what we see the ghosts of. And you know, as time is getting closer, or perhaps on the anniversary of it, there's a need to kind of replicate this horrendous event. James, any ideas on that one? That's that's a strange one. I mean, oh, what do you what do you do with that? I'm going to say no, no. Uh, yeah, nothing. it's it's a hard one. Um, you could because of the when it's dated which is 1906 the ghost the ghost the element of it can be tied into perhaps in in some way uh given where it occurs which is oregon uh let's think maybe it t- you could you could have in some way as a story element or or something that turns up in a game of wraith the great war because that obviously is just after and well, during and just after World War One, and is to do with the ghosts in the underworld. So, this could be some sort of location. Um, again, maybe uh, a ghost of one of the victims forms a is a geist uh, of a particular type, uh, which it's fits it's... into a type of death that occurs, which defines the type of geist you get in in uh, Geist the Sin Eaters. Yeah. It could possibly be, um, maybe you might use it for Hunter, for uh, some kind of a, a monster, maybe like a siren or something, like the ship. The fact, oh, so, right. I mean, it's it's looking at a particular detail, but it says that all of the uh, the women and children perished. Maybe whatever kind of siren it is specifically draws women and, and children that isn't as interested in the... Uh, the men and that might be why no, the uh so many of the rescue efforts went wrong whatever it is is using its formidable powers to keep people away um mm. it mentions it mentions a submerged reef and jagged rocks which would be just a perfect location for something to to live and hide in um cool and the lighthouse itself could have been there we go. The lighthouse could have been an arcane defense system created by the uh, created by the hunters of the time, and maybe the lighthouse is getting knocked down or something, which will bring whatever it is back. Yeah, that's cool. I there guess you could, also, you could also wrangle that as a as something for mage and uh, uh, hmm. or something for technocracy. So yes, uh, I know of a ghost story. Uh, about a pirate, uh, Klaus, uh, Klaus Stortebicker, um, who was from Hamburg. Uh, he lived in the 14th century, and his name means a beaker at a gulp, after the practice of requiring crew members to drink a huge beaker of beer in one gulp to join the crew. Um, he operated in the North and Baltic Sea, and some sources say that his ship was named the Sea Tiger. Uh, he was a famous pirate who was eventually captured and set to be executed, uh, but he promised a chain of gold long enough to wrap around the city if he and his men would be freed. Um, this offer was turned down, uh, so he stated to the headsman that his, he and his crew should be lined up, and when he was decapitated, he would rise and walk past them. Each crew member that he passed should be released. Uh, the headsman didn't agree to this but after his decapitation uh klaus stayed true to his word and walked past 11 of his crew members 
Um, so his skull is on display in uh, in a museum in Hamburg. Um, so he's definitely like, uh, and his ghost is sometimes seen down by the riverside of um, uh, which is the one that goes through Hamburg. Oh, the Rhine. I think it's oh. maybe the Rhine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, I suppose it's not actually the ghost ship, but um, an interesting, interesting pirate story um, from my time back in back in Hamburg. So, how were you thinking of using that in World of Darkness? What was your idea? So, I had a couple of notes on this one, which was um, maybe. Uh, where are we right so um he maybe as a ghost he has decided to recruit people to his crew um and he forces people to drink uh so maybe people are found having drunk literally just drowned themselves in drink um maybe maybe it's a revenge against the descendants of the headsman um so that could be a kind of a world of darkness ghost story. People have found drunk to death, um, or uh, um, because he's seen as quite a bit of a folk hero in Germany. Um, it could be that someone's trying to summon him or bind him, and to do that, uh, there's this. You know, he made this offer of a golden chain around the city. Maybe someone is trying to build this chain. Um, it could be worked into like a cable company. They're lining their cables with gold and building like a circular ring around the city of Hamburg um, so that they can harness whatever etheric energy I, uh, you get from a ghost. Um, yeah, I like I like that that he kind of almost he could almost invert the promise because he said he would give them the chain but of course because mm. kill them instead he would use creating that chain as some as you say some sort of curse against it to ex- exact some revenge um i think that's a really good one okay we will move on to the next segment which is new world of darkness world of darkness 2.0 So yes, I have uh, a review of, to go through for Book of the Deceived, which is for Mummy the Curse. Uh, so I've been sat on this review for a while. Um, so this book kind of blows open some of the secrets for Mummy the Curse. So if you're a player of that, it might be good to kind of tune this out. And if you're a, if you're a storyteller, then I think maybe it's the type of thing to listen to and a book you want to pick up um so the whole thing is that we start off with we have the idea of um osiris who's also known as azar and it turns out he originally was not a god he was the head of the shaniatu who are the who are um a type of of uh a type of magical magic using beings who who create who ultimately create the arisen who create the mummies and the shaniati taught so taught the the law the law i say in in in, in commas of uh, of the judges the judges being their gods so the law is basically about how reality is and how the world should work the law requires uh uh, change uh, requires though change and death. So it's about things being created and things being destroyed, and that energy to progress and flow. And as things are destroyed, then it's almost like saying you have to have things made for them to have potential, and then they're destroyed, so new things can be made. But that potential is what is conserved and is what allows the judges to exist. And some of that energy is also fed off and given to Amut, who is like. So it's kind of a weaver and the worm kind of feel to this. Yeah, I was I was just about to mention that. It sounds very much uh, like the weaver and worm. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, we 
the book then goes on to explain that the Shaniatu, uh, you, you've got all the different top areas and they represent different things. The Shaniatu were the knower of names. And the Shaniatu uh, mimic humans. So there's a sim- so they were created by the judges, but they're not human. So they kind of, all, again, have that feeling kind of like they're kind of like Prometheans. And their task in, in life is to, I say life, uh, is to guide humans. Because ultimately it's humans that create things, that become relics, that create the very energy, uh, the, the sekem, that is then feeds the judges. Okay? Now the nameless then discover that when people die, they become ghosts. And these ghosts go to the underworld. And they try and go there. And when they enter Twilight, it's kind of this boundary reality between... Or or not reality, but a boundary state of being between our world and the underworld. And they're barred from going into the underworld by Anpu, who's also Anubis. And because of this, they, they, they learn that humans are allowed to go into the underworld and join the judges. And the Shaniati become jealous of this. They're like, well, we should be the ones that go forward and, uh, you know, sit at the side of the judges and, and glory in their spoils as reality churns away and creates more second. Uh, so... They have a plan. Uh, they look to Astet, who's also known, also known, eventually becomes known as Isis, who's the last of a tribe and is the lover of one of the deceived. And they make they will ultimately make use of her. Uh, obviously, as I said, energy from chaos, the Shaniatu keep chaos, and the Shaniatu keep chaos at bay. So that's their job. Uh, Ampu, uh, control, Ampu Anubis controls Amut, who is the uh, crocodile-faced hippo, uh, and Ampu is control of certain demons to do that. Uh, so Ampu basically helps ensure that Sekim is channeled off to the judges and it's not misused, uh, and that while there is the law of life that the judges control, there is also the law of death, which Amut teaches or makes the the Shaniatu aware of. So the Shaniatu, also known as the Restless Stars, they want to have a place... uh, uh, They they want to place one of their own, uh, which is Osiris, or... Uh, not Osiris, they want to place let me get this right they want to place one of their own um, amongst the, uh, sorry, they want to place one of their own amongst the uh, the judges or in the underworld and usurp uh, Anubis's position. And they do that by by killing one of their own, which is Osiris, Cutting him up into the number of parts that the legend has and feeding him to a human because a human, when they die, becomes a ghost and is able to pass into the underworld. So they feed it to Isis. And so Azar, so Osiris, one of the one of the Shaniatu, is able to pass into the underworld and now become one of the judges of death. But Azar doesn't talk doesn't correspond to them he doesn't contact them he doesn't have any way to to help them so they so they kill lazar uh they fed him to to isis he's he he as isis dies and they both go into the underworld and as a result anubis is dethroned and azar uh now is it has control of the law of death so the shaniatu try and work out how they can then join Azar in the underworld, in this realm where they can be the lords of death and 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 glo- and, and enjoy the spoils of, of, of Sekhem that comes from that. So uh, 
they 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 fun, finally understand that they have that the key that they have is that they have control over the concept of creating words and their meaning and the will and they have the will to create new names so they would learn the law of death and subvert the judges of of life the the true gods and give themselves names that have power that makes them gods essentially so this takes a long time uh they create they create the city of Iram uh and uh they teach humans magic and the arts there's a bit of a revolution and by mortal sorcerers who they put down and kill and the shaniatu keep doing you know keep control they, they kind of forget some of themselves and they learn from amut you know the the uh the chaos kind of being uh how to uh they eventually learn the right of return, which is how they create the arisen. And also they learn how to then place themselves in the underworld and give themselves true names. So the idea is basically that they, they're trying to no longer be slaves by keep, by creating new slaves that can work for them. And so they can assert the position of the, the true judges. Uh, in this time when they're creating Aram, there's an empire in the east, which is called the ki en uh, and there's a war against them, and they kill numerous people, and they use the souls of the slaves of the of that conquered group to barter with Amut uh, to learn the right of return. Uh, they kill the king of these people, who becomes a vessel for Amut, who talks to them and explains uh, the right of return. And... Uh, yeah, they kill like you know slaves, you know numerous times, and they create the uh, the arisen to be their uh, to be ultimately be their slaves. Of course, uh, when this happens, uh, the Shaniatu, the the rest of the stars, who who the group of Shaniatu who know this. Um, so I need to split this up. So you've got the Shaniatu, who are all of these kind of like beings created by the judges. There's a group that are called the Restless Stars, who create, who know, who are the creators of names. You've got the other groups of Shaniatu, who create each of the groups of mummies that you play in Mummy the Curse. Okay, you know the okay. the architects, the the bearers of amulets, the 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 funerary priests. The creators of 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 words and and of scrolls and so forth, but the Shani are to the rest of the stars that group. They're the ones that ultimately want to gain power, uh, but they plan to be so when they plan with the other Shani Atu that they will become all become judges of death. The Shani Atu want to become the lords of all of them. So they want to be the lords of lords, if that makes sense. So they would all go into the underworld. They would all be gods of death. Okay. Over the other Shaniatu who would become minor gods of death, somewhat. And of course, that's not the other Shaniatu are not happy of this. So ultimately, when they perform the rite of return the restless stars are betrayed by the other orders of the Sh- uh, other orders of shaniatu so when the right of return happens the other groups go into the underworld and become the judges of death their mummies are formed and become their slaves in in the real world in in the mortal world and what happens to the restless stars well the right of return is modified and it means their souls are shattered. And so their arisen are actually conjoined souls between the soul that was going to originally going to make their mummy and a portion of the soul of one of the restless star Shaniatu. Does that make sense? Right. So they wake so that each of the Shaniatu of the restless stars that was were betrayed by the other orders of Shaniatu, they they awake 
with different faces. And then all of their arisen gather at some point in history and realize that they're all holders of a portion of the soul of this full be of the of this full being. So it's kind of like a sin eater in that the the, the mummy of the restless stars of the deceived each holds a portion of a soul of a, of one of these shaniati who wanted to be the lords of lords in the underworld in the duet. Oh man. So the heretic, right, which is one of these uh one of these arisen that is trying to f- in some respects trying to to free all uh, all other arisen from their slavery to the the judges is is an arisen who was given a name by the deceived. So in some respects, he's kind of like the inversion of Osiris. Whereas all the arisen are slaves to the judges, the heretic is trying to free them from the judges and ultimately from Osiris. Oh, blimey. Uh, yeah, so there are obviously each when you make a character that is a member of the deceived, obviously uh, you are you're playing a character that has conjoined soul. They have no decree to a judge. They never when they die, they never descend into the duet. They have mental issues because of they are essentially kind of possessed by a portion of their shaniatu who represents one of the deceived. Uh, the deceived, though, are not deathless. They're something else. So so the Arisen are deathless. They never die. Uh, they can be ultimately destroyed, though. Uh, you've got then the Shoaxan, who are not deathless. They're an inversion. They're kind of corruption of death. You've got other versions of undead in the setting. So the deceived are not deathless. They're termed as eternal because they have somehow been changed that they can... They're a concept that can never be destroyed because obviously the the restless stars were the creators of ideas. And the idea they created is of eternity. Uh, they can be summoned to, a, to any corpse. So if their body is destroyed, they can be summoned into a new body. But they can never become Schwanksen. So they can never become the, the, the weird undead that Amut creates. Uh, so their descent is reversed. Death to them is preferable. They don't want to come back to life. They want to die. Uh, uh, they are... They hate the lifeless, which is the Schwarzen, and they uh, claim a higher purpose than the Arisen. So they hate Amut, and and, and they, they believe they follow a truer purpose path than the Arisen, who obviously work for the gods of the Duat, the judges, who in fact usurped the rule of the true judges of the law. So the deceived are the bad guys of the mummies, but in some respects are kind of like, could well be the the ones that allow the Arisen to become free. Uh, yeah, it's it's really it's a really really interesting book that gives a, uh, a a new insight into the setting and really gives you a feel for what's going on. Um, it'd be interesting if Mike was here to talk about, uh, Mom, uh, but James, you've obviously read Mummy the Curse, so how, what do you think of all this compared to what you've already read? Um, unfortunately, it has been quite a while since. Um since I got my copy of Mummy um, and I haven't had a chance to play it since. I know uh, it was one of the times when I was actually on uh, on Dark Days before talking uh, talking with one of the writers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it sounds it does sound interesting to be uh, to be coming from that other side really and so, as you say like the um, antagonists having an understanding of your antagonists antagonists for the um the uh the core books group of mummies that actually seems 
it seems interesting, and my, especially from a well. You mentioned that this is probably not something that the players should be looking at. It's more for the uh, certainly the the history of it is more for the uh, the storytellers. Yeah, and having an understanding of that, I think, always gives more ideas about what you can do with it, and gives yeah, you th- insight I... into motivations. I totally agree. I think it definitely it definitely uh, helps with ideas for Mummy, and I think when I am ready to run Mummy, uh, this ties in with it a lot. Um, the idea, I think, Mummy obviously ultimately at its core is this idea of of being a slave to a higher power, uh, and that's seen in how you can create a, a player group which is a Mummy and its its cult. And its cult is Kurt can just be the other player characters, or are all the player characters? And the the mummy is actually a storyteller uh, used character. And it would be interesting to have that dynamic where they become more aware that what the mummies are doing is not quite right, and that they are slaves to these high are really are slaves to the higher power that is preventing their memories and that there is a group out there that is potentially offering them uh, freedom and insight to the people that they're slaves to. Uh, It is a really, really good book because I I found Mummy quite intimidating in the sense I really didn't know how I would run it. I have got some ideas on how to run it and I wouldn't mind doing that at some point. I think I just need the right player group and motivation to jump into it at some point. Uh, it was also an easier read than, than uh, say, Guild Halls of the Deathless. That book was really, uh, at times, quite uh, verbose and, and impenetrable and, and really going, ooh, we're creepy because we're creepy, rather than actually giving you good reasons why the, the mummies are creepy. Whereas, whereas this is... Uh, is interesting. The other thing that's kind of a bit heartbreaking when you read through the background of the deceived is that it's all written from the perspective of oh, I can't remember his name, the name of which one of the deceived it is of the of that group of the rest of the stars. But he he is the lover of Isis, and so he gave up his lover to Osiris. So that makes it more kind of like hurtful for him. Um, yeah, so that was pretty cool. Um, now, if we haven't got anything more to add, uh, I think I think that's it. Uh, I don't think there's any more closing remarks. We did say we had a uh, competition, competition winners to uh, to announce. Um, what I will do for that I think makes more sense is I will ask Mike to record that just the announcement of which people won rather than do it now uh, because it's full details of what we're giving away um, it should be I think there's one at least one I think it's two copies of Midnight Circus hard copies uh, I know my copy is pretty much pristine condition uh, to give away those are the prizes so we'll be announcing, I think, at least two, at least one winner, possibly two. I think it should be two winners uh, for the competition. Uh, and as always, uh, if people want to get in contact with us, you can email us at darkerdaysradio at gmail.com. Uh, they can also find us on Google+. Plus. We have the Darker Days Radio community. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook. We have a Darker Days Radio Twitter. And we also have, which has been a bit more active of recent, uh, it's kind of like a... Sam, how would you describe the Darker Days Radio Tumblr right now? Um, gifts and arts. Gifts and arts. So you're collating... You should also start reposting every so often, like, a classic episode of Darker Days Radio. Just... Yeah do that but no, that's cool did you did you hear all that james because yeah that sounds pretty that sounds pretty good actually i'll have to uh i'll have to add that to my followed tumblers 
it's, there's just so much if social it's media. Already. There's just so much social media, and we can't like, we can't all manage it all. Um, on the blog, on the blog, of course, we have Darker Days Radio blog, which is active right now, rare, very active, and uh, will be more active in the coming uh, weeks and months to continue. Um, of course, that is where we post all, where I post all my miniatures gaming crap. Uh, so there's pictures of me putting together stuff uh, and ideas. Uh, there's pictures from uh, the Iron Kingdoms Unleashed unboxing for the intro game there. Uh, there is a uh, uh, an actual play report for uh, Mike's Ravenloft game, which I need to continue reading at some point because it's hilarious in places. Uh, there is the actual play report of our Iron Kingdoms game, one shot that you took part in, James. That's written up there. Mm-hmm. There is a battle report of War Machine versus Hordes, Signal versus Gatorman. So that's my game I had against Alex, so expect another one soon. There is also a battle report of my game of Guild Ball versus my uh, one of my work colleagues, Kai. Ah, uh, so there is lots and lots and lots and lots of content there. So have a look if you're into any of that gaming. Yeah, James, you've got a have you got your blog running? Um, got anything recently? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been quite quiet for a while because I've uh, I've been working mostly on running this D and D campaign, um, and my players have kept me very much flying from the sea to my pants. I had to. I respond to some rather bizarre stuff that they do. Um, mm-hmm. But I wrote a review for D&D 5th edition uh, yesterday, actually. Oh, right. And cool. I posted that up there. Um, yeah, so that's... Hopefully I'm going to review... Um, they're actually review, releasing their first setting book for D&D uh, a year into it, which is quite quite slow given or given like 3.5 as a reference like third edition and fourth edition had so many expansion books um whereas it's it's taken it quite slowly and i'm interested to see how they add to it um and what they add in these books um Hmm. so i'll probably write a review up of that um i was going to say other things to check out is uh, obviously, at the start of this month, uh, Midnight Express put out an episode which covered the Daughters of Cacophony. So that's kind of a, I think, one of their shorter uh, offerings of Midnight Express. And previously, they did a Blood Dim Tides reader companion, which fits in rather nicely with the fact we've been talking about pirates uh, for our secret frequency. Uh, <laughs> Mike says he's got a ping latency of. N- of this is brilliant. Of 9,999 milliseconds. Oh, my <laughs> word. This is over 9,000! <laughs> um, right. I think Mike's going to have a hell of a lot of fun doing that. So, at that point, we will say goodbye. Thank you for listening to Dark Days Radio. Um, and Mike's phone is on cell data. There's no way he's going to come on, come on there. Um, so I'll leave it there. So this is a bit of pre-show banter that's mostly going to be put somewhere into the podcast. Banter involves Nando's. It may be cheeky. And what? The Bantmobile begins. Bantmobile begins, maybe. Bantman begins. Um, (laughs) So this is going to be maybe some initial discussion of uh, what James and I... Uh, right now quite interesting it falls into the horror genre uh it's a game which has some horror rpg elements to it and that is kingdom death which uh 
we can provide links in the show when I can find them. Uh, so, James, I mean, I didn't get on the Kingdom Death bandwagon uh, until you alerted to me. Uh, and, of course, I didn't pledge for it. I piggybacked your pledge. Thank you very much. Well, I'm uh, very happy to be of service, eh? Um, so why don't you give me, why don't you give uh, people that might be listening uh, right now and give our listeners a uh, a description of what Kingdom Death is. Uh, so Kingdom Death is a uh, tabletop RPG board game, a uh, miniatures based board game where you are... Um, you control a small outpost of survivors uh, of, of humans who are um, surviving in this strange, inhospitable kind of wasteland. Mm. Um, and one of the few resources available there, it's, it's mostly just a sea of stone faces. Um, but the, the resources they have available are the horrific monsters that stalk the darkness. So you end up having to hunt down these horrific monsters to be able to have food and make things and craft stuff and you develop your um pardon me uh, you develop your uh civilization over time and you develop them with things originally you don't even have language or uh, communication and you have to learn all these things over time um yeah and i was really attracted to it uh because the the models look kind of amazing and hunting hunting monsters is kind of my jam uh, indeed. I mean, so, uh, I mean, so it has a campaign element to it, yeah. uh, which is equivalent to, I guess, the classic miniature board games of its type are uh, Hero Quest, War, Premier Quest, and it has a campaign element then uh, similar to, say, the classic like Necromunda and Mordheim. Uh, miniatures wise, they are hard plastic. They're by uh, they're fabricated by the same company. Um, so Kingdom Death obviously is using a uh, a manufacturing company based in China, which is the same one I believe that does Malifaux, and that shows that these are very high quality miniatures that make a that piss on I think Games Workshop's making right now. Um, and gameplay wise, uh, we're expecting very much Monster Hunter style. So it's kill monsters, take their body parts, make cool things, and hopefully survive. Yeah. Use the... Kill monsters, turn them into hats and weapons, use those to fight bigger monsters, which seems to be... You know, it gives you a very nice sense of progression. And uh, what else can we say about it from unboxing? There's a lot in there. I mean, a lot of people have said, like, when's the game going to be cheaper again? And the original pledge was, what, about $100, maybe, um, for, the, for the core game? I think it was $80 for the core game. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was for, uh, contents-wise, for what was at the time, maybe a third of what there is now in the box game. Yeah, the box, the box that actually got released is twice as big as it was originally thought to have well, it was originally planned to have been. I think it's maybe bigger than that, even because there's a lot more cards, and uh, it's a very impressive box. If anyone's been on the Darker Days blog, they'll have seen the pictures. Um, Sprue wise, there's three monsters that you can hunt. So that's the White Lion, Screaming Antelope, and Phoenix. So you can hunt each of these at three difficulty levels. Uh, there's a few nemesis encounters. They occur at certain points within the game, and that's the butcher, the kingsman, uh, the king's ha- the hand, sorry, and uh, and eventually the uh, the watcher. Uh, and then you also have the armor sprues, uh, which essentially allow you to make uh, per armor sprue give you enough parts to make four miniatures, two male, two female. Uh, meaning you can mix and match between these sprues and also make an entire sprue, make an entire figure, which is wearing one particular type of armor. So there's a hobby element in there to kind of either, as you progress, you could WYSIWYG the models, which are, some people are trying. I think it's a lot of hard work. 
Um, there's no need to WYSIWYG, so I would say maybe immortalize certain of your here uh, certain survivors that uh, you have in your campaign, immortalize them uh, as miniatures, which is, I think, the route I'm going to go for. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, um, it's got a really nice system with the equipment where you arrange... Uh, equipment comes as a card, and you arrange it on a 3x3 three three grid, and depending what on what is next to it, you manage to activate extra abilities. I can see people building... Uh, building miniatures for kind of gear archetypes that end up being really strong. Like if if it turns out that having two whips and heavy armor works really well because you can annoy monsters, you're probably going to use that in a lot of your games so you can kind of go, yeah, mm. whip guy. That'll be a... Um, the other interesting thing, uh, obviously because I'm uh, fortunate that I've got my copy of the game out of the pledge that turned up at your mum's so um i've had a chance to open up uh i've not looked through the only things i've looked through is obviously the initial uh section on the rules and i've flipped through i've looked and just kind of browsed the events mainly looking at the art to be honest um i'm trying to think of other things that are similar to there's kind of a choose your own adventure kind of feel to this game so there's a lot of replay value uh, in how the events occur. Uh, you can go into the game quite blind in that you don't know how you're going to fight monsters or how an event could affect you. Um, the I was going to say something really profound then, maybe. Uh, uh, so there's, I think there's the, the main rules of the game, the main core rules of combat and everything, fits since like 10 pages, maybe less. Oh wow! Uh, it's very small that section of actually how the game works. Everything else is all like the vast majority of the book is taken up by events and how to run the campaign, uh, which I think is very good. Um, the so there's, I think, in a cooperative way. So this can obviously the game can be played one player or it can be played with anywhere up to four players typically, or even up to six uh, with uh, one of the variants. Uh, of the gameplay and I think when you've got a group of players there's quite a kind of a role play element in how you maybe choose how your settlement develops and what what a group of players believes is important for their settlement like do they learn how to paint or is it more important they learn to write or is it more important that they uh understand a certain metaphysical property of the universe uh you know things like that and given maybe a lot of how much bad the bad reputation that maybe kingdom death got due to like the pin-up models and other notorious kind of design choice if you have a mature group of players i think you can get quite a, a very deep role uh role play narrative narrative emerging narrative out of the game which is um could be quite a cool you know gaming experience yeah like one of the uh the the idea of emerging narrative one of the things that uh adam poots who uh who ran the uh, development of the game he's uh he said he doesn't want it he doesn't want to give you hard and fast answers of this is why the universe is in this way and this is exactly what monsters are doing and what how it's working out um or what the uh what the driving forces are behind the things that happen to your village um Hmm. so as you said going into it blind that that sounds like it could be quite fun from a mutual exploration point of view you don't know how to fight these monsters you don't know what's going on you wake up in the darkness as blind to the situation as your survivors are. Yeah. Like, so related to that, I think it, the the whole how you don't know what the game, the, what's really going on, why they these poor humans are in this weird, uh, uh, you know, weird um, hor- horror environment um, is how cruel the game. Some people are finding how cruel the game can be with certain things that happen. 
And that seems to be grating against certain people uh, who have got into it for the kind of, who are purely kind of the board game type people who've got into it, who it grates against them because they like to have a certain level of, um, of authority within the game about how, of, of the experience they get out of it. So, you know, when you play a board game, everyone's having fun because the game is balanced and the game has a particular theme, but it doesn't punish you in any way. The only punishments come if you make bad choices. Yeah. But Kingdom Death can be quite, quite from what I've gathered from some people, can be quite brutal in that you you can randomly have any old damn event occur and some of them could just end up with you losing a great number of your population of your of your settlement, uh, or losing particular artifacts, or or some such, and or even completely ending your campaign after only a few lantern years, hmm. and that that's grating against people because it seems almost very arbitrary that on a on a draw of a card on a roll of the die, you know, dead that's another character dead or game over. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you think that's, that's, that's something which seems to be jarring if you're a board game player, but like if you're say maybe a role play game player, maybe a classic dungeon crawler kind of role play game player and a war game player, you kind of just have to go, well, that's the dice, ain't it? And you just got to get on with it. Yeah, I definitely think you've got something there. I we've got quite a big, uh, quite a big board game scene down here on the Isle of Wight, and one of the things that people have often expressed frustration at is games where you have elements of chance in it. Because you don't, you don't want chance in your game. You want to have determined things so that there is a right play. And if mm. you make your right plays, you're kind of, you know, you are fast tracked for winning. And it is about assessing what is exactly the right play at this moment i think role play game like people who have played much more role play games where you are reacting much more to the situation and the situation is changing and especially as you say role players because you have a gm on the other side of it so you mm. might react to a situation and go we have to sneak in here so we're all going to actually make sure we prepare and we dress up like ninjas and sneak in in the darkness and the gm is going to go oh, I have to throw some spanner in the works so that it's interesting. Here's a counter, uh, a counter, and you do, you roll with those punches. The dice, something happens on the dice, and you go, yes, my character, my character did die. I guess either people are going to have to pick me up and we'll figure something out, or it's time to roll a new one. Mm. Um, I, I do quite like that, though. I think that's where you get... That's where you get the more interesting stories. Like I, yeah, I can't think of any time where I've ever wanted to tell a story about Monopoly, for example. Like this one time, I got Mayfair and Regent Street, and oh my gosh, I got so much money; it was hilarious. Like, whereas I can think of a hundred stories of times where I've tried to nobly throw my character in a roleplay game to their death and they've actually managed by some complete fluke to not die uh, and save the day or at least make an impressive uh, impressive show of getting themselves absolutely wrecked mm. I guess I mean that's the, I think the key point is that with this game is you're making the by putting in these things where you can really lose and really have dramatic losses is what makes you really then care. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes you kind of, you know, wary about taking some choices uh, because it'll screw you over. Um, I was thinking about this in, the, in context of what Eddie Webb always says, uh, or he just runs as a kind of um, a presentation for live action role play. And, that I've taken to heart for for RPGs is that concept of like play to lose, where bad things happening to your character in an RPG help drive the narrative in more interesting ways. And that by taking that risk, 
you can be rewarded by the GM. And I think mm. in some respects, Kingdom Death makes it clear that really to make any progression, you've got to do things where the risk is high. Yeah. I mean, even think like the first, uh, the first encounter, for example, is a really good, uh, is a really good case point for that because it's set up and you, you're not really expected to win the first one. Uh, Sorry, you know. broke up. You broke up just then. You said the the first encounter is set up so that uh, the first encounter in Kingdom Death is set up in a way that you can lose. The, uh, you start in the middle of a fight with a, a lion, yeah, and you can lose that, and that is that can be the whole intro to your experience with Kingdom Death. Hmm. You lost four guy. You lost four uh, four people to a lion. Now let's get on to the main game. Um, you know you're you're basically you can be set up with a a horrific massacre um it kind of reminds me actually because you have stuff to lose it rem- um you i think you're going to weigh up your decisions a lot more but you also need to be mindful of uh town development like you're doing this you know as much as you're going to have your characters that you're attached to you're trying to you're trying to support a community mm and I think that's going to be oh, yes. I'm I'm very excited to get my uh, to get my hands on it to actually crack the box open. Indeed, indeed. Um, it's it's nothing prepared me for unboxing it really. Um, and like you know, I've had in my time uh, what box games are we going to go through? Like uh, a copy of Necromunda, uh, a copy. PR Necromunda, uh, not Necromunda, Gorka Morka, um, Epic 40,000, uh, that edition of that game, Blood Bowl, uh, third edition, uh, and, you know, obviously when I was work- working at, uh, oh, hold on, was there? there was Talisman, and, you know, I've had friends, you know, you go through the, um, you unbox it and you go through, because they finally get it and you're like, oh, here's a copy of Space Hulk and unboxing mm. that. And uh, obviously when working at GW, there were various new editions of games then. Uh, unboxing like, you know, Battlefleet Gothic. Um, and of course, Hybrid. And I would say, you know, Hybrid had a lot of stuff in there, but it didn't have anywhere near as many models. But the quality of the pieces in Hybrid were very, very good. Like, you know, the cards. And I, I mean, you've seen them. Like, the amount of the amount of detail, artwork, text on the on the cards, the quality of the card components, like the tiles for the game. Like, Hybrid, I was right in getting it back out of storage and plunging into that and enjoying that game because, to me, that was kind of... Ex- close as I could get right now to the quality that Hybrid has delivered and in some respects maybe exceeded. Uh, I mean, the quality of the cards, like the feel of them, the map kind of finish them, is really nice. The box itself is fantastic. Um, and uh, there's just so much stuff. You open up and you're just like, oh my god, where do I begin? And kind of just having to take your time and just put together those initial survivors and the white lion and get ready to just play the first encounter. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. Is it worth $400? Uh, what $400 to us is like what? 300 and something. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's probably about more like 280. Um, yeah. Most probably. Um, two hundred and it's two hundred and sixty, right? Okay, so two hundred and sixty for a board game. Okay, most games workshop board game. Uh, most games workshop core games now are what price? Let me just go on because I'm just going to go on to like uh, Wayland Games, which is it was classic UK. My, my copy of uh, Space Hulk that I um, that I rebought recently was, I think, seventy five pounds. Yeah, um, okay. Space Hulk goes for quite a bit. Yeah, 
So you're looking at about seventy five pounds generally for a a uh, starter box game from GW. Mm. Okay. Um, and that that also goes fairly well with um, uh, some of those games like uh, S- Super Dungeon Explorer. Um, that's I've seen that quite uh, quite a lot in places like Waterstones and things. But you it, you get quite a lot of models with it. You get some decent some uh, some card stocks or some cards for the game and things. But yeah, I think two hundred and sixty pounds. The the amount of stuff you're getting in the Kingdom of Death box is is huge compared to. Mm. Um, and I think you're probably like. I think having that that struggle, being able to lose, but so you might not even get to the end. I think that's going to be something that does give you more re- replayability, rather than a lot of board games are set up so that you know you're going to play it for like an hour and then you're you're done. Uh, yeah. Maybe, like little, you've got these tiny little segments, but most of it just stands individually on its own. Like I've never seen anyone run a campaign of uh, Super Dungeon Explorer, even though it supports it. I'm just looking up some other other like board games, like price wise that came out recently. Like you've got AVP by Prodos is equivalent to Space Hulk in the amount of miniatures and card content, and that's like seventy five quid. Uh, you've also got um, Imperial Imperial Assault. That's a fantasy flight game, uh, board game. That's like eighty quid, and they don't have like half the content compared to compared to what we're getting. And then, of course, you've got like really. I'm trying to think of like some board games that have got like you know massive amounts of like cards in them. Um, I guess. Uh, one of my favorite like fantasy board games is because I already did enjoy playing it. Was um, was uh, Chaos in the Old World, mm-hmm. and that was a great one. Um, but I'm just also bringing out some other things because like these are all uh, interesting for price wise comparison. Arcadia Quest. Is like eighty quid, and that's just mainly for the miniatures, isn't it? It's the amount of miniatures you get in there, but they're pre-made. It's by the same team who uh, who did Super Dungeon Explorer. Yeah, um, so you get a similar amount of uh, of bits in there. Um, the models the models are nice, but they're quite small, um, and as you say, they're they're fully pre-made. They're just uh, they come as is. Uh, then you've got, like, say, Journey Wrath of Demons, which has a lot of miniatures in it, a lot of card uh, tiles, uh, but it doesn't have any anywhere near the amount of, like, printed material, and I think has less replay value. So, and that's, like, 100 quid, uh, pretty much. Um... Oh, you got very loud there, James. And... Oh, pardon me. Sorry, I um, I was I sneezed, so I turned my microphone off. And I think oh, I was right, adjusted. Fine. Yeah. Uh, Rum and Bones is another one that's again a, a cool mini or not, and that's like eighty. So I think I think because you you've got some of these games that can have like so many cards in them and be uh, quite expensive as board games. And then, and then you've got on top of that the miniatures. I think I think what you're getting for your money is quite good. I don't know. Maybe this is an American thing. I don't know. And board gamers, because board game players are used to a type of experience of board games, and they're not into the miniatures. And mm. clearly, one of the things is is that when we say when we compare the amount of miniatures you get in Kingdom Death to other games, you can't reduce it to the fact that you get all. You know, 32 survivor. I think it's something like 32 survivor miniatures in total. Yeah. Because <clears throat> each of those survivors is um, 
is about is um is multi part. So you'll actually when you make up a model, you're left o- you're left with so many bits that at some point, you know, you're gonna go when you replay through you're like, oh well I'm gonna order a new armor kit from from Kingdom Death because I want to have a few armor kits ready to build new characters and I've got all these bits left over to make you know the new character how I want with a particular head and with a particular weapon outlay and a particular body um, yeah I mean mm-hmm. you get a lot of stuff uh, and I'm I'm really looking forward to having as much as the minis can be great for playing with I'm also looking at them and I I have been eyeing certain things up as oh you know what I could I could do with some minis my uh, my tabletop role play campaigns yeah think, yeah yeah like the variety of uh, of outfits and stuff like the, there's a uh, one monster called the sunstalker and most of the armor is made out of uh, it uses teeth like big flat yeah. herbivore teeth as um as like scale mail and things and that just looks it looks very funky. I'm very impressed with what I've seen. Um, I'm trying to think of what, what else is interesting to say. I mean, I've already mentioned the artwork, and uh, the artwork has a particular style. Uh, I would compare uh, the, the art to... You know, they've got clearly a, a style which is reminiscent of the artwork to uh, Berserk, um, uh, which is an anime and manga... Uh, and yeah, you know, it is kind of the monsters and everything in it are, and some things are really gross. Like some of the artwork is kind of horrific, but it does quite have clearly on the back of the box. This is a game for ages 17 plus up. Like they're aiming at 17 plus up. So this is R, you know, this is like meant to be R rated. Um, which is good because like you know people were complaining like oh this is going to be a barrier to my to my children never wanted to do war gaming that's like yeah well you know it's not for that age if you want your kids to get into war gaming there's far better games out there uh yeah with it with its focus on on body horror and like the corruption of the human form or the distortion of it um mm. yeah i i could see it being I could see it being the thing that would maybe give some give kids nightmares and things. Um, and if if you don't like that type of thing in your game, just don't play it. I mean, the yeah. same thing with the same thing with World of Darkness. World of Darkness, you can take down various different routes of body horror and 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 content in general. And it's up to whether people want to play that type of game or not. And guess what? Kingdom Death is a single player game. Ultimately. So if people don't want to play it, that's no loss because someone can. We can quite happily enjoy at home the hobby of putting together miniatures and playing through this game. And when you compare it to, say, playing a computer game, well, you know, for me, the the interest there is, you know, the actual tangible kind of use of cards and and. Uh, miniatures because i like painting toy soldiers as we've seen um i think some of the scale of the conflict as well because you're gonna because you have the uh the minis things like the uh the phoenix which is one of the mini uh the monsters you get in the box is absolutely massive yes it is big and it i've seen the smaller i've seen the uh survivor minis and it kind of towers over them so you'll you really get a sense of that kind of scale that I think sometimes gets lost in uh, in video games when you're, you're especially if you're doing like a grid based uh, turn a uh, grid turn grid based turn based game. Like you'd probably just be looking at your minis from uh, your little gifts from above and going, "Oh yes, this guy's." Just in. Yeah, because like when you play like when you play like certain games and you go into like the first person mode. Uh, that still doesn't really help because first person mode in some games does give you a sense of scale of say the monsters you're fighting does dark souls run in first person mode if you want um, dark souls is uh third person um i think 
I don't think there is a way to play. The point, I'm, the point I'm getting at is that like, often, like you know, it's easier to play the game if you're going to third person with some of these, so you don't like fall off a cliff randomly. Yeah. Uh, especially when you've got a dynamic fight going on, and that's where, as you say, you lose a sense of scale. I mean, because obviously you've played hybrid, and uh, I'm trying to think, like the. So you were you were using the Griffin versus uh, the uh, Alchemist of Durs, and like some of the monsters that Dur- the Durs faction use are big compared to what you have as as the uh, Lodge of Hod, who are uh, trying to trying to purify these laboratories. Um, I think you get that sense of scale from the photos as well that we've done for the games. It kind of helps with the immersion. So, yeah, it's going to be good. Um, there's some other play modes that I'm interested in. Um, if I can, if I can get the uh, book. Uh, oh, I think the interesting thing is, as I say, you can play the game like single player. You can play it co-op mode, which is those two modes are pretty much the standard way. Uh, the other game variants we've got are five to six player, which changes um, changes a few things. The monsters are a bit tougher. Uh, okay. uh, And uh, let's see. So it's interesting. It's interesting because it, it makes, yeah, it just basically makes them tougher and you don't get any additional rewards on killing the monsters. So, you know, resources are, are more scarce per player. Yeah. But you've got more models on the board. And the monster's tougher. So it kind of, it's all to try and balance out. There's a quick mode, which makes them tougher, but it also makes, well, it just basically makes everything like a bit, you know, survivors are easy, easier to kill, but also they can dish out more damage. Okay. Uh, and hero mode, which is basically your survivors don't die. They just get knocked unconscious. So it's kind of a, that's your easy mode. Death mode is where, uh, is kind of like quick mode, but also that if your survivors die, their gear is, is lost automatically. That normally doesn't happen unless you've got a, a TPK happen. Ooh, that sounds, that sounds very dangerous. Uh, s- solo play. I've already said, um, storyteller mode, I think it's quite interesting in that um, one player is the GM. And what they do is that they control the monster. So what happens is normally the monster has an AI deck and you draw from that to see what the monster does next. And based upon the options, the monster acts. This means that in bet- each time the monster, before the monster acts, um, it says... The storyteller never controls the survivor and always acts as the monster controller. They may freely reorder the monster AI deck during the showdown. So that kind of means the storyteller is trying to stack the deck in their favor <clears throat> versus when they stack the deck in their favor, the the they may the way I would do it is that the storyteller like would would before the survivor survivors get their round of actions because normally it goes the monster attacks and then all the survivors act I would say at the end of a monster's round of action I would yeah. have the the, G, the storyteller be able to to stack the deck how they want because that means obviously you can try and pr- you can try and put actions where you want them but also you've got to be careful that maybe the survivors maybe the players are quite lucky and they make some hits and you lose certain cards that you prearranged in the deck. And that way I think it maybe balances out the GM having full control versus the GM relying purely on luck. Hmm. So at least then as a, as a storyteller, you've got some, 
you've got some element of risk in there and a bit of pre-planning. Uh, also, the storyteller picks which settlement event is triggered uh, in the settlement phase each uh, each cycle. So you get to say what happens next. Like you can say, oh, well, you know, the settlement is overrun by you know some sort of vermin or something like that. Uh, so that's cool. Then we've got Seven Swordsmen, which is where you play with a population of seven ageless survivors. <laughs> and that means as they die, you don't get any new people, uh, which is crazy. Um, people of the Skull, that means that uh, they only use bone weapons and some such so it's just a way of theming the uh the 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 game yeah but we know we've got something like that coming up because people of the skull is 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 one but we've also got people of the sun is uh, that right yeah. so and that's that's a play style that comes in which expansion uh the um the people of the sun is from the sunstalker expansion um which is like a great big flying it's like a cross between a shark and an octopus that eats light and gets worshipped by a village. And you end up, uh, you end up starting in a way that uh, um, you get benefits from this symbiotic relationship with uh, with this strange entity. Um, and there's also one for the Dragon King. Oh yes, because that's the expansion I've got coming. Because obviously yeah. you've got every expansion coming. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, you, you, you madman. I I went in on it pretty hard. To be fair, mm. uh, yeah. So, people of the dragon will be will be interesting. Uh, yeah, and that obviously also gives us a different um, end game. So, I think that changes the. You don't go up against the watcher. You actually go up against the dragon king, which is which is huge. It's like a what one hundred and thirty five millimeter tall miniature. So. In context, all by about twelve centimeters across due to its wings, ten centimeters across due to its wings. I think I read the Dragon King is thirteen and a half centimeters tall, so it's twice as big as the Phoenix. Oh my goodness! Twice as tall. Um, another campaign mode is Twilight Night in training. Uh, one survivor is, a, is to be the Twilight Knight, and so basically you've got a you've basically got a special snowflake survivor amongst your starting survivors, okay. and uh, they are they are they are ageless and can still hunt when retired. Um, so yeah, it's basically you know your your settlement starts with a superhero straight away, uh, and then of course it says if you're itching for more after completing the main. Kingdom Death game. The game is easily customi- customizable for a group that is familiar with the rules. Uh, so yeah, I was thinking, given that I have plenty of weird monsters with an alchemical nature to them, mm. I may look into making custom decks for uh, for things like the aberration from Hybrid, or uh, or maybe you know the um, the multi armed. Uh, nefarious clone that would I think that looks kind of cool uh, and also you know like um, you could swap out the white lion and use the tigers of Durs. Uh they would possibly you know look kind of kind of cool on the board um, yeah I mean, stuff like that your um, your uh, storm knight model that you got um, oh yeah I need the expansion for that and slender man well, the Storm Knight didn't actually come, isn't it? Uh, he wasn't going to be released an expansion. He's um, kind of a standalone model, but you could always put something in because he's he'd probably be like a nemesis, like a uh, like one yeah. of the knights. I think someone's trying to write up on uh, write up a uh, custom deck and encounter for him. So I think there was something like you know where he kind of does a whirlwind kind of effect where it means everyone within a certain range of him gets moved around. But 
I think that's mostly based on the fact those people have looked at the other decks for existing monsters and come to some conclusion of what makes sense. But yeah, there's that, and obviously Slenderman has a uh, is a nemesis encounter, and he's got uh, his own his own interesting uh, uh, event and stuff. So yeah, I'm keen to do keen to go up against Slenderman. I will most probably get hold of that expansion and. Uh, and well, it means I, I can I can use my resin Slenderman immediately and uh, and think about how I paint Slenderman too. Uh, <laughs> he'll be plastic. Um, yeah, I don't. There's yeah, there's a lot that's going to be coming out, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how this game ultimately the setting and all the expansions work because. Every little bit is a piece to the setting, which is ultimately going to be an RPG setting as well. Yeah. So, um, if I uh, if I've got my facts straight, the Kingdom Death Kickstarter was originally created because Adam Poots had uh, written a whole bunch of setting information for this role play game he wanted to make, and he wanted to make something that actually took advantage of it whilst he was working out his his rule sets and things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of similar to when you consider the history of Iron Kingdoms. So Iron Kingdoms uh, RPG came out of the fact that, you know, pr- the guys working at Private Press, um, you know, were trying to, were developing the war game, uh, War Machine. And... Obviously, uh, you know, getting a war game ready takes a lot of takes playtest, and mm. but the setting was obviously already uh, more fully formed, and so they wrote the uh, they wrote the Witchfire trilogy, which is um, which was a a, a welcome uh, a welcome. Uh, Alternative setting to run uh, D twenty Dungeons and Dragons in, um, yeah. Uh, what other expansions are we expecting for Kingdom Death? There so there's the um, there's the Gorm, which is like a cross between a giant baby and an anglerfish. Um, yeah, that's a weird one. There is Spidicules, who is a He's like a big daddy long legs, uh, but his body is mostly this strange humanoid mouth. Well, a strange humanoid face that hangs from these long arms um, and it dangles corpses as a lure to people in the darkness. Um, There's a bunch of different knights who serve as nemesis. There's the dung beetle knight. There's the flower knight. Um, The flower knight is a very nice miniature. It's absolutely like it's very cool, and we it would be it would be wrong enough not wrong of us not to mention how astounding uh, Tommy Sewell of uh, Golem Painting Studio, how astounding his non metallic awards and and whatnot. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I need to get the Flower Knight. Um, what other expansions then we've got? We've um, got so there's uh, the, the Manhunter, who's a nemesis expansion. Um, he's uh, uh, He looks kind of like a witch hunter. Um, he carries around a lynching post um, with him, uh, and he is huge. There's, uh, there's the Lion Knight, who is a uh, humanoid, but he has like a lion's face, a big mane of hair, and um, big clawed hands. Um, and then there's the Lion God, uh, which is, if you've fought enough white lions, you get yourself in some serious trouble. Yeah, the Lion God looks cool, and I think it's definitely uh, definitely something I would um, something I'd like to pick up um, because obviously I'd like to kill a lot of white lions and uh, yeah. and and take down their uh, their creator. Oh, and um, can't forget the uh, the Lantern Festival expansion, which comes with the King. Is it is it the I, King? I yes, think it's the King. Um, um, no, the Scribe. Sorry. Well, it comes with the Plastic King and the Scribe, uh, oh, and a couple okay. of 
um, a couple of game hunters as well as a Twilight cloak miniature, which uses armor made from uh, the Twilight, uh, uh, the Fallen Watcher. If you if you beat him, well, hopefully, hopefully the price on these expansions because I've got to get them uh, is not going to be too massive because they're because mm. uh, uh, it's not buying the box game, so yeah. that'll be good. Um, yeah, I, there's so much. Uh, there's so many more resin miniatures they've brought out. So I, I as well, which God knows when they may well be represented in either Kingdom of Death or whatever game follows next. Uh, I mean, it's quite surprising because, like, given given that obviously Poots has tried to deliver a certain gaming experience, he's tried to depict a certain gaming, uh, certain fantastical horror setting this game while attracting a lot of ire from people as it's now been finally released and it's into players hands and reviews are making it out and there's review videos which we will be doing one i am going to be doing some video of uh a more pitch well the plan is i think we'll do a um, i'll do a a video where it's going to consist of us two talking mm-hmm. over uh, the fact that what over a well, it's mostly going to be repeating a bit um, video of like images and and also video of uh, of of the unboxing and also the contents and the layout of the game, so we can comment on that once. Obviously, I've played a bit, and hopefully, you may well have uh, had a chance to play some. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but it's interesting like how the game has grabbed the attention now of of the wider kind of like uh public because people are clamoring to try and get hold of a copy mm-hmm. either to get the survivor pledge which is what you've got yeah uh or or just to get the box game but not have to pay $400 for it uh because People think four hundred dollars is too much for a game which has this amount of content in it. Again, I still don't know whether that's too much. Four hundred dollars sounds a lot, but then four hundred dollars sounds a lot. I'm sure sounds a lot, but if you transform that into pounds, it, to me, it's not as much. Two hundred sixty pounds yeah. is a lot, but I mean, as at the moment, there is a limited availability of uh, pre-orders available on the website for a reduced price. Um, that's about for what? That's about. Th- there's something like about three hundred, three hundred instead of four hundred dollars, um, which is, you know, that like the fact that the pre-orders have, uh, Poots has dropped the price on a on a couple of occasions really for the pre-order, um, where people have expressed ex- interest in it, um, which is is very very good of him really. Oh, um, we've got Black Friday coming up. God knows what's going to happen then. Yeah, because uh, all Black Fridays previously has been another time to get the pledge in. So the Survivor Pledge, James, that yes. you will have in your hands at some point soon, uh, when you uh, when you acquire it <laughs> off your mother, who had the god awful mountain of stuff. Ar- I say <laughs> mountain, huge box. The mountain mountain of stuff is yet to arrive. Um, so the Survivor Pledge differs from what I've got because it has what else? So it has um, an additional Phoenix miniature. Okay. Five bonus plastic Kingsmen. Um, okay. A bonus Watcher. Uh, two unique survivors, Paul and Aya. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, they're expl- uh, They're labelled as Explorers of Death, so they're actually more kind of more armoured. It looks like they've been established in the world a bit more. Um, a bonus set of raw, uh, raw, oh goodness, rawhide armour. A bonus set of phoenix armour. A bonus set of the lion armour. Um, a snow the uh, snow the saviour miniature. A bonus set of starting survivor miniature heads, so that you can they uh, the original miniatures, the original starting survivors. You can actually use them on armour sprues, because um, hmm. you'll have these as multi part heads. Uh, and it will also have the uh, the plastic Twilight Knight that was uh, was added as a Christmas gift a few years ago. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. Wow. And I mean, it's yeah. interesting that people are clamoring to get hold of the survivor kit, the, the survivor pledge, because really, it's extra miniatures, but it's not really extra game content. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I and Paul, I don't think they come actually. I don't think they actually come with rules. I uh, actually, I think they, I think the extra survivors may well do, but there'll be a web um, release. Okay. Uh, from what I've read, so um, don't quote me on that, but I have read somewhere there's a web release uh, of of that. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to go onto the Kingdom Death actual website. And I just have a look at other things that if I, when I have the chance, once I've got everything I painted and things that I want to, that I would like to add to my collection. Because obviously, as you said, I've got the Storm Knight. Uh, we've got the Wet Nurse because we've got the Wet Nurse because it was just like, it was cheap. It was, it was part there. of a, uh, a test of the uh, the printing methods, the plastics, yeah. wasn't it? It was for doing PVC rather than doing... Um, doing uh, hard plastic. They're originally going to do... I think they're originally going to go with PVC. Uh, the difference is the softness of the actual um, the sculpt. Uh, let's see. If I was to want to get anything else, I would want uh, the Flower Knight, because it's cool. Mm. Uh, the Flower Witch you've got. Oh, yes, I did buy the Flower Witch, didn't I? Um... Yeah, I uh, I think it's a cool sculpt, pretty much. Yeah. Um, Forge God is a really crazy miniature. It'd be interesting to have. Um, the um the gold smoke knight uh, is quite interesting. I think I think the work you did on the on painting the uh, the storm knight could make the the smoke knight look really good as well. He's kind of um, yeah. He's wearing a suit of armor, but it's it's mostly just royals of smoke billowing out of it um which i imagine would be an interesting interesting paint job to have to have to do uh the game hunters are both cool i kind of wish i got the halloween special twi- pinups for twilight night just because i like yeah it's I, kind of cool uh, um, the king the king yeah the king is a really crazy model i mean he he is built like his rib cage is built out of arms and he wears a scarf which is made out of babies all clung together it's it's it is a weird thing um but mm. it, it's going to be interesting um he's also that one of the inter- one of the things that came up on the website is there's actually a range of uh, characters for for role play games like um there's a mage and a rogue and things which i think were originally intended to be for the the later role play release um, and those actually look kind of interesting. The I was going to say the other one, which we know they're already play testing something for, uh, which seems to be more of the dungeon crawl to do with the tunnels, is the uh, Nightmare Ram. Oh yes, that's a weird figure, but again, would be so much fun to paint. Um, the People of the Sun for mm-hmm. uh, that go with the Sunstalker again. I think they're really cool because they quite clearly have a. Uh, East Asian look to them. Mm. I've actually seen someone uh, cosplay uh, as uh, do do the cosplay based on on them. Uh, that's mm. really wicked. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got uh, we've got the pinup save. I've got the pinup sci-fi Twilight Night. Thanks to you, which I need to at some point paint. Um, which comes with two. Which was an interesting one because we opened up and it came with the two um, lanterns in there, the oh, lantern yeah. gear cards, which was, I guess, kind of our first prelude to what we were expecting from Kingdom Death because that gave us a sense of what the card components would be like for the game. Um, Satan, Satan is <laughs> Satan's a crazy, crazy figure. Well, figures. Um, yes. Uh, um, I've got obviously I've got the white speaker uh, resin figure which is that I've got painted so the white speaker is an event so I had a look at what the event was for that so I could convince myself whether I had to remount her on one of the actual bases for the game or keep her just for a cool photo if the white speaker ever turned up Um, Mm. scribe the twilight night 
uh, Twilight Order Knight, uh, uh, the Visionary I have, and of course Visionaries are a um, type of survivor that can occur in your encampment, in your settlement. Uh, yeah, they're basically your superheroes that turn up, uh, demigod or or whatnot. Um, oh, so that's kind of cool. Um, I've got the um, I've got the warlords, uh, the f- male and female warlord pair, um, which are going to be interesting to paint up at some point because they look quite quite solid and buff. I really like the white knight models. Oh, they were cool. So the warlord models. Oh yeah, that's um. Hold on, let me. Let me go back and try and have a look at those. I forgot about what they were. Uh, Survivor male, visionary, variant. Oh, the warlords, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, they're pretty. They're pretty buff, aren't they? Yeah, it's. Oh goodness, do they have the? Do they have the first lion knight on here? He's um. Oh, oh no, there's a, a first white knight model and he's got like a cloak of it looks like a cloak of living flesh with a big f- screaming face in it. I know um, the model you're talking about. I've seen it painted by someone and it looks fantastic. Uh, yeah. It's it's really gonna be interesting where how much of like what we've seen as as resin figures and teasers to what the greater setting is turns into actual uh, gameplay uh, material because obviously the same with like you know we've got pinups obviously but it'll be interesting to see how um, uh, to see what some of the things which are non pinup will will be in the game uh, yeah there's just so much there's so much stuff uh, and you know we've yet to uh, yet to even play our first session and have all our survivors maimed and you know body parts ripped off and uh, and so forth. Um, <laughs> it is going to be that harsh. It is going to be ridiculously brutal, um, and I am really looking forward. To to... I think the other thing, oh, when we're joined by Mike, he's finally uh, here. Um, the other interesting thing is that because we'll have two core games, uh, James, it will be interesting once when you're up and ready running with it is um, the fact that as long as one person's got the deck of cards ready, mm. is that both people can actually play the game online. And, the, and related to that, is the fact that uh, there is going to be a official uh, tabletop simulator version of uh, of Kingdom Death because so many people have wanted it. It's been unofficially done without the blessing of Mister Poots, but now it has been uh, confirmed that they're going to do it. So because people want to play it and playing online is obviously as sometimes as close as you get to enjoy this game in its uh, yeah. in that form and it works as it might work as quite a nice way for people to uh, to demo kingdom death without committing all the money to it like some because yeah. the box is going to be quite expensive uh, not undeservedly so but it means that you can have it you know you might buy the uh, the digital version for a fiver, play it and go, yes, yes, this is exactly what 